chlamydia, <laughs> tuberculosis, influenza, don't forget Ebola, disease and death. I can see you all cringing from here. What a terrible way to introduce myself. <laughs> but, but these microbes are the ones that give bacteria and viruses their bad name, which is very much undeserved because 99.9% .9 of all the microbes on our planet are essential for our very existence. We would not be here if it wasn't for these microbes, the good microbes. So I'm all about the good microbes. Of course, we worry about the others because they affect us directly. But you've got to remember, the Earth is a closed system, and so all the elements have to be recycled. There is no such thing as water that hasn't been recycled, and microbes ensure that both carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and phosphorus, and oxygen are all recycled on our planet. God forbid my body doesn't decompose when I die so that someone else gets a chance to live. But those processes of decomposition are essential for our existence. And we owe so much to bacteria. We take for granted the air in this room, the oxygen we are now breathing, is the bacteria are responsible for. Because 3.8 billion years ago, there wasn't a skerrick of oxygen in the atmosphere. It was all methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, until um, the evolution of bacteria and a photosynthetic system that gave us the cyanobacteria. Now, some people call them blue-green algae, and they're not algae. Please don't ever call them that, because they're not algae. They are a bacteria with a photosynthetic system. So whenever we chat after, and during the, just don't, don't let me hear you say blue-green. I want to hear cyanobacteria. They are bacteria. Over a period of two billion years, they changed our atmosphere. And through photosynthesis, because they turned the carbon dioxide back into oxygen and made sugars. And you just got to love photosynthesis. I tell you, I'm just always in awe. A bit of light, a bit of CO2, and we get oxygen and sugars. And to this day, our technology cannot replicate that system. But I just think it's fascinating. And of course, at the same time as these ancient cyanobacteria did this, their carbon got fossilized and was buried in the deep ocean. And of course, it's the oil and petrol they are, we are now rapidly burning and putting back into the atmosphere. And today's microbes can't work fast enough because they've evolved a rate of return, of this return of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere uh, to the deep ocean. It's only about 0.01%, but that rate's been fixed. Now we're putting it back at a massive rate because we're just burning the old, the old carbon. Uh, hence, our climate shifting. Um, now, of course, today... Oh, sorry, I meant to say this. I haven't... <laughs> I forgot this slide. Um, the, uh, in Shark Bay, West Australia, and uh, the Atacama Desert, these are remnants, if you've ever been there, uh, these are remnants of those very ancient uh, cyanobacteria. So even today, there's still a, still a few uh, outcrops around. So today, carbon is recycled. And the, bu the bulk of that recycling happens through respiration. Every time you exhale, you are putting back out the CO2 that came from the carbon in the food you ate. Now, bacteria are doing the same thing. They, they, the aerobic, what we call aerobic heterotrophic bacteria, but I'm going to call them bacteria from now, this is a little qualifier, um, and they need dissolved organic carbon as food, and then they use oxygen like we do and generate CO2. And that's, that's what I call dissolved organic carbon. And the bacteria can only use it when it's dissolved. And what I want to do is demonstrate to you with some sugar I stole from the cafe yesterday morning, just for you. Um, and um, my spoon here. So this sugar came from a plant, of course, and photosynthesis again, a uh, bit of light and CO2, and we get sugar and all, all that energy and lots of calories, unfortunately. Um, and you put it on, let's put a little bit in here. It's still solid right now, and this is fresh water, like you'd find in any creek or dam drinking water, and it's going, it's going, I put too much in. Quick, hurry up. Okay. It's dissolving. Okay, once that sugar's dissolved, we now have dissolved organic carbon. So I'm going to use that term a lot, but that's what I'm talking about. Now, the bacteria in this glass have now gone into, uh, they'll take them about half an hour, but they're going into a feeding frenzy. All of a sudden, they've got all this organic carbon. I just put lots of oxygen in there, and they've been gearing up, and they're going to turn all that sugar back into CO2 in a few days. Now, I don't, it would go cloudy. I don't have a baked one to show you, but 
believe me, it will go cloudy, um, and all that sugar will be gone uh, in a couple of days. But there we have closed the carbon cycle. Now, there's a, there's a cycle as I've described, so what goes into the system through photosynthesis comes out in terms of carbon, but there's a missing link. We are short two gigatons of carbon on that return pathway. So when you mathematically model and put together all the natural processes, we're missing. Two, you know, a gigaton is um, uh, 10 to the 9, what's that? Uh, two, that's 2 billion tons of carbon are missing in that return pathway. So my quest has been to try and find this, uh, this source or this, uh, this pathway and how it returns. And this is a bit of a spoiler, I've kind of given it away here. Um, but what I'm going to do is talk to you about my adventures and my endeavour endeavours trying to, over the last 15 years, find this missing link. And of course the answer is going to be in microbes. <laughs> um, now, now, I want to introduce you to all my best friends who are in this brown bag. Or oh, my daughter says it's brown. I hope it's brown. Here they are. Obi Obi Creek. Uh, let's take the Mer uh, Mary River. Let's, let's, let's start with that one. One mil of fresh water is in the bottom of this test tube. And this is typical of any river system I've, I've looked at in southeast Queensland. That's one mil, right? That contains in a freshwater system 100 million viruses, 10 million bacteria. 100 million viruses, that's four and a half times the population of Australia squeezed into the bottom of this test tube. That is normal. That's a natural freshwater system. And they're all good bacteria and viruses, OK? Don't forget that. They're the good bacteria and viruses. And I've measured how fast they replicate. Those 10 million bacteria are replicating every 20 minutes. They've stopped in that test tube because they've ran out of sugar, if you like. They've run out of their organic carbon, so they can't do any more. But in a natural system, that's what's happening. And I did this in the Bremer in, in the early 2000s, and I found for every kilometre of the Bremer River, the Bremer River was putting out a half a tonne of CO2 into the atmosphere. And when I first measured this, I was astonished. I'm as astonished as you are. I can see the astonished look on your face already. <laughs> no, seriously, I, and no one would believe me. No one would believe me, and even I didn't believe me. So I went and did it again. And then I went and looked on the lakes and creeks and rivers of southeast Queensland. Didn't matter where I went. Where in a productive system, I got the same thing. That is a hell of a lot of carbon. And you don't see it. No one sees it. No one measures it because it, it's a, a it, well, initially it's a very awkward process to measure, but i got a really good way of doing it now. Um, and <laughs> it's fast, so I can do more. Um, now, there, there, you have to ask, well, how can this be ecologically? How can this be? And fortunately, I can tell you now, because it's taken 15 years to work it out, but it's because of two things. One, the sugar that's going into our creeks and rivers, the dissolved organic carbon. It's not just sugar, it's lots of anything, any, anything organic that's dissolved is a great food source. And the other are viruses. And you need to know how viruses work. Remember 100 million viruses in one mil? Uh, I, you've been looking at that, so there's pictures of them. That was actually from the Bremer. So this is how a virus works. It attaches to the outside of a bacteria. This is a virus. Landing on the outside of the bacteria it looks just like a lunar module landing on the moon. Seriously, it's exactly what it looks like. And so when it lands on there, it injects its DNA into the bacteria, and then it takes over all the metabolic machinery of the, uh, of the bacteria, makes lots of copies out of itself, and then the poor bacteria just... It bursts out of the bacteria, and all the guts of the bacteria go everywhere, and that is literally more of the same organic matter going back into the water column. So... That happens not once, but happens over and over again, because more bacteria then eat. It, you know how long it took me to do this slide? I won't tell you. It took, me, <laughs> it took me a day to get that bacteria to eat that carbon. <laughs> but it, 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 the, the chomping, it, that's what it's doing. That, it's actually eating dissolved organic carbon that's coming from those viruses. So they're cannibalizing. They're cannibalizing. But, and then each, each time it goes through that cycle, it's, the bacteria is using oxygen and it's generating CO2. So, you know, it's the same as us. It's so all, the, all its food and all the organic carbon is going, like back in that glass, it's going back out into the atmosphere. That explains why the process happens so fast. It's not a cycle. Once the, once the virus and that cycle, that process loop starts, it's like a spiralling down. And viruses are shutting off cutting off all the bacteria from passing up the food web. You know how you always think, oh, little things go to big things in food webs? No, there's a whole separate pathway over here where the bacteria are just 
have one job, respire everything. And then, of course, they make minerals and nitrogen and phosphorus recycle that, and then all the algae uh, in the water column get eaten by small things, macroinvertebrates and fish, etc. So that's the other pathway over here, but I just, I just like the virus and bacteria. Um, I'm not a fish person, as you can tell. My, colleague, <laughs> my colleagues love fish and algae. That's, that's, that's not me. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the viral, that's the viral, that's the viral, uh, that's the viral side of the story. Now, the dissolved organic carbon source, this food source, you've got to have, you've got to keep topping this freshwater, something's topping up this freshwater, all these freshwater systems with organic carbon. And it's coming in in huge amounts really fast. And it's just going out just as fast for the reasons I just described. Terrestrial sources, plants, um, and phytoplankton, algae in the water column, for it, that's what we call phytoplankton. And then there's us, what we put back in. And um, have you ever noticed fish gills after a storm event in your local creek? Um, I don't know if you noticed, but um, it's most likely not going to be toxins. In fact, it's rarely toxins. It's because the stormwater has washed all of the organic carbon in that catchment into the creek system, and the process that I've just described, bacterial viral lysis and uh, bacteria turning over all the organic carbon, have just gone into a feeding frenzy, and so all of the organic carbon turns into CO2, but what goes at the same time? The oxygen. So all the fish suffocate, and that happens so readily, very easy, easily. Sewage overflows, another example of that. But that's just massive. The fish kill won't be because of toxins in the sewage. It'll be because the organic carbon has driven this process and just goes so fast um, and goes out of the system. Um, Oh, the other thing, that's right. Now, Noosa Shire Council has much nicer drains than this. I've been wandering around Noosa and they, in their stormwater drains. They have great little pictures of all kinds of platypus and fish. This is a very boring one, but, but this is my, my local one. Um, biodegradable detergents. Ah, if I had any hair, I would turn it out, pull it out. <laughs> um, biodegradable detergents um, and environmentally friendly detergents, uh, they're intended made, designed as to be great food for bacteria because they're intended to be in the sewage treatment plant. That's why they're called biodegradable. That's why they're environmentally friendly. If you end up letting those detergents go into the gutter or street, they will end up in the nearest creek. The processes I've just described to you kick in, and so you are very not protecting the environment by letting that happen. So don't wash your dog, your cat, um, your house, your car, and let that water or that detergent end up in the nearest uh, gutter because it will end up in the nearest creek. Every gutter you see, every drain you see will end up in your nearest creek. So organic carbon is a disaster in our creek. It has, it's meant to be in the sewage treatment plant. If you can keep it on your property and let it uh, wash your car on the grass and you don't see any runoff, it's, it, you're actually, the soil is actually then being benefited from the microbes in it. So it's a positive thing. So one thing I had to ask, though, was... Um, all the work I've just described to you and the high rates of bacterial respiration I've been finding have all been uh, in... Is there something wrong with this clock? Because <laughs> I don't have a minute and 35 left, do I? <laughs> OK. Um, OK, very quickly, now I slow down. That's it, you're in trouble now. I have to go really fast. OK, so... Um, I, I wanted to know if it wasn't to do with our urban environment. So I packed all my stuff and went off to Panama um, uh, with uh, my, all my equipment and I started looking at the Panama Canal. And as you can see, my only friend for four months was my camera. Um, so I'm talking to it an awful lot. And what I did was I worked on a place called Barrow, Colorado Island. And um, it's totally pristine. Uh, it's all forests. And I spent, um, after, after four months of dodging alligators and drug runners from Colombia and getting, and getting, I'm serious, and getting lost. I got lost about four times, ended up in hospital for four days, had the scar here to prove it. Uh, and um, I discovered that it's just as high. There's no, there's no urban environment here. Um, and 50 tons of carbon per day. Uh, and then the rainforest itself, the, what doesn't go into the trees and, and what doesn't get respired in the land was 40 tons. So it was actually feeding the microbes in the fresh water around that system. Oh, my God. I, yes. So anyway, I've gone on and looked at other places around the world as well. Um, and didn't matter where I went, 
the same thing, except up in the boreal forests of North America uh, and in Canada, because what was happening there when it came to winter, in their winter months, it went through zero. Uh, and uh, what else was I going to say? Okay, so in summary, one hour at a time, in summary, um, rainforests aren't our endless sink of CO2. We can't rely on them because what goes in comes out and it, all the microbes in the fresh water are consuming it. Um, and that's fair enough, but we can't rely on organic carbon um, uh, for in, in the rainforest to actually uh, stop us using fossil fuel. We can't use it as an excuse not to use fossil fuel. We have to stop using fossil fuel. Who walked here today? Oh, well done. <laughs> Who rode their bike? Me, I did. <laughs> no, nobody else? Okay, I knew I, knew I was going to ask that question, so I cheated. But <laughs> <laughs> the urban environment we're replacing with has all this stormwater in. We have to look at it because, and we can't even determine what those sources are in our urban environment. We have to find out what they are. Um, I, I know I, I made light of the uh, washing car in the street. That's not the only source. There are a myriad others we don't even know about. So we have to. We have to. I'm going to get thrown off here shortly. I'm going to. Well, and we're going to have to find out what they are, and we're going to have to fix them. Um, on top of that, um, when I actually calculate globally how much CO2 is coming out of fresh water, I calculate, even though fresh water is only 0.01% of the entire planet's water, and we're talking about surface water, is only 0.01%, um, it's generating as much uh, CO2 into the atmosphere as the entire ocean is burying. And it's, 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 more than, it's more than the annual burning of rainforests, but there's no smoke, there's no fire, no flames. Out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but it's worse than that. It's not on anyone's mind. I've actually been to New York trying to talk to climate change modelers. Um, it's not even on their agenda. So I would really like us to stop using fossil fuel and get the fresh water onto the agenda. My last slide is, I just want to say that whenever I look at Earth, I am just in awe at her beauty. But when I start discovering the complexity below her surface, I'm even more astonished. I'm, I'm just hoping that I've shared some of that discovery and complexity with you and that you can see that extra beauty that I've been able to see. And thank you for being such a wonderfully warm audience. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, yes, Nina. <laughs> okay, Peter. Get on your bike. Uh, thanks, Nina. I will. Bye. Go. Bye, all. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, Peter. Peter Pollard, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>